Okay. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Welcome to Otter Talk number 10, the immune system and titers. Uh, Joe Ellen Gregory, DVM, is joining us tonight to um, give us her titer presentation that she gave at the Pennsylvania Nationals. Thank you for being here tonight, Joey. We appreciate it. I know everybody's interested in this topic, uh, both otter home people and non otter home people. So, with that being said, you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Marie. Hi, Marie. Are you feeling better? Much, except Good. I'm very, very tired still. Oh, okay. I'm Good. sorry we're sick. Oh, stay away from COVID. Stay away. Bad news. Good yeah. advice. But we both got, both Rich and I got tested. We're negative, so we're good to go. Good. Good. How long were you sick? Uh, about two and a half weeks. Wow. Oh, good. So, I'm yeah, but luckily we had minor symptoms, none of the major uh, bronchial uh, breathing difficulties. So it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. What happened to the <sighs> Well, I'm glad you're feeling better, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're thank feeling. Thank you. Okay. okay. Am I screen sharing? Anybody? No, know? nothing's come up by me yet. Is it black? Because my screen's yes. black. Okay. Then I'm probably screen sharing. Let's see if this works. My, uh, I, I'm going to be repeating the presentation that I gave at the 2017 national. Um, oh. Uh, regarding vaccinations um, and information about vaccinations. So um, if you were there, then uh, hopefully this will renew what we talked about then. And if you weren't there, hopefully I'll have some information for you. Uh, obviously we're living in a different time now than we were then. And I think a lot of people have more information about vaccines and viruses than we, than the average person knew uh, three years ago. Uh, just because of COVID and, and all of the stuff going on in the world. So if you guys have questions, um, you can type them in as we go. And then in between all of our um, subjects, we will, I'll, I'll take questions to try to make sure that we're answering everything that we talked about. Just so you know, uh, my PowerPoint presentation is giving me trouble. And I was trying to edit it tonight to add some new things, um, particularly about the nomographs. And uh, I can't, so we'll just talk about it and it will be recorded for posterity in that regard. And if I can ever get it to, to edit, I will add it. And then, uh, but I'll send this presentation over to Robin so that she can post it with YouTube. So what we're gonna start with tonight is about how vaccinations came around and the history of vaccines. We're gonna talk about how they work, what different types of vaccines they are, side effects to the vaccines, what different vaccination protocols are out there for dogs, what options we have to vaccination, um, and then about the reliability of online information. I think that's something that's critical in, uh, in this world and always. So with a history of, of vaccinations, uh, vaccines started back in Europe and Asia with a smallpox uh, epidemic, and they use the term variolation they found that by giving healthy people tissues from sick people, the healthy people wouldn't get sick. And so the practice began to slowly spread as its ability to protect against smallpox became apparent, but there was their problem. Sometimes it was fatal. So uh, two to 3% of those that had the, the disease tissue would die from smallpox. Uh, but that was in contrast to 20 to 30% who died after contracting it naturally. So um, they did find that the variolated individuals, the people, the healthy people that got the tissue from the sick people, they could pass the disease on to others. I think it's really interesting talking now with the pandemic going on, when we've heard about things, you know, if can you get it, if can you get it again, if you have it, can you transmit it? And so this is all going back to the 1800s with smallpox. In, uh, in 1800, Edward Jenner found that by inoculating people with cowpox, it would prevent smallpox. And that was actually the first vaccine that was made. 
so he transferred pus from one milkmaid to another and he spread cowpox around and that basically stopped them from getting smallpox. And then it was many years later that Louis Pasteur developed the vaccine for rabies and his process of vaccine development is the basis of most of our vaccines today. So vaccines and veterinary medicine, um, keeping in mind veterinary medicine was established to study the diseases and prevent outbreaks of plagues in livestock originally. Uh, cattle plagues were common and so it was up to the veterinarians to try to protect the investment that farmers were making. And then from cattle, veterinary medicine turned to horses and then to dogs and then to everything that we do today. And it's still our, our role to combat disease, but also to prevent the spread of zoonotic diseases. And those are the diseases that can be transferred from animals to humans, um, such as rabies, leptospirosis, brucellosis, um, coronavirus, and, uh, and some other things. But luckily vaccines have come a long way from smearing pus on each other. And uh, many of our veterinary vaccines today are specifically formulated to work within the sensitive animal body systems. For example, um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, cats have a terrible habit of developing vaccine associated tumors. And so there are new vaccines made specifically for cats to be safer. So that's a pretty fast history. Does anybody have questions on how we ended up here with vaccines? I'm going to go with no. Okay. So how do vaccines work? So we're going to talk a little bit about how they work and we're going to talk about the immune system. And I want you to keep in mind that this is a very, very rudimentary um, introduction to the immune system. I am not going into all of the different ways that the immune system works because your heads would be spinning and it would be not worthwhile because there would be nothing that you would remember. So I'm, going, I'm trying to go with the stuff, the, the most basic points that will get it across and have everybody understand how it works. So vaccines mimic the disease and to get the body's immune system to respond. The pathogen, which is your disease causing agent is covered in molecules called antigens. And we've heard lots about antigens with uh, COVID. Vaccines have antigens that are similar to the antigens on the disease, but they don't cause disease. And we'll talk about a couple of different ways that the vaccines can do that. But basically it primes the immune system so that it's ready to respond with speed and strength if the, if the immune system sees that disease again, that antigen. So antigens are presented to the body via the vaccine. And then there are antigen presenting cells in the body that roam around looking for disease and picking up those antigens. When the antigen presenting cell sees the disease, it will ingest the antigen, break it up, and then put a piece of it on its surface. And then the antigen presenting cells will travel to an area where immune cells cluster, like a lymph node or the spleen are most common. So then the naive T cells, um, that are specific to that antigen become activated when they recognize it as foreign. There are T helper cells that will alert nearby. And then we're gonna talk about them in a minute. There are also killer T cells that will go to kill, but the T helper cells are coming first. And then the B cell activation happens. Naive B cells will react to the vaccine antigen when it comes into the body. Some of the B cells will undergo division and produce more active B cells, B cells so specific to that antigen. Some will develop into plasma B cells and others will become memory B cells. It's a lot of Bs and Ts, I know, but hang in there, we'll get there. So when the B cells mature into plasma B cells, those are the immune system's antibody factories. And so they're activated by receipts from by receipt of signals from the T helper cells and the vaccine antigen. The plasma B cells secrete the antibodies. The antibodies will bind to specific antigens. And then the binding may mark the antigen for death or just prevent the antigen from entering the cell so that it's not gonna cause disease. 
So here come the killer T cells. Those are the other half of the T cells. And if the vaccine contains um, an attenuated virus, which is a modified by virus, which we'll talk about the different types of, virus, of uh, vaccines in a minute, the vaccine virus will enter the cell. The killer T cells find the invaded cells and they destroy them. The naive killer T cells will still require an antigen presenting cell to display the antigen before they become activated. That's a very basic um, look at it. What we have figured out over, over the years is that, oh God, something just happened with my puppy, uh, <laughs> is that um, it's also has to do with, uh, it's like a four stage theory now where the antigen presenting cell gets together with a major histability complex. Um, and there's a couple of different classes of the major histability complexes. And what's interesting to me particularly about uh, the major histability complex is that's one of the things that they're looking for when they're looking at genetic diversity is how many different copies of major histability complexes do dogs have. So, um, it really goes back to how well their immune systems are gonna work when they're looking at the major histability complexes. So off of that, um, back to the retention of the memory cells. So your goal of the vaccine is to produce memory cells. So cells that will remember the, the, anti the antigen and they can kick into gear if they ever see it. And that way, if the real pathogen enters the body, the immune system will recognize it and respond stronger and faster than if it had never encountered the pathogen. Everybody with me still? Okay. So vaccines will program the body to respond to a disease or a pathogen by allowing the immune system to practice on a weakened or killed pathogen. And that's a primary immune response. But when the pathogen comes in the body again in full strength, the immune system kicks in and that's a secondary immune response because it's already seen it. And so that's usually gonna be a stronger response than the primary response. It'll make more antibodies and it makes even more memory B cells for the future. So the animal is vaccinated. What happens when they're exposed to the disease? We have our memory helper T cells created during the vaccination that we talked about, recognize the antigen that's presented on the antigen presenting complex, antigen presenting cell, sorry. They signal and alert the other cells to mount an immune response. The presence of the pathogen will reactivate the memory B cells. Remember, those are the long lived ones that will react specifically to a particular antigen. And the memory B cells will respond to the presence by activating and differentiating into plasma B cells, which are our antibody making factories. So the plasma B cells make the antibodies, the plasma cells will produce more antibodies, the antibodies attack the pathogen, the vaccine response cause, cause, uh, could cause a killer T cell response, and then the memory killer T cells will respond and mark everything for destruction. And then we will keep even more memory cells after we have seen this, this particular disease again. Okay, so that's our short and quick how the immune system works. I know it's a lot of information and a lot of B's and T's and everything, but does everybody get the general idea of how, how it all works? Any questions up to this point? No questions yet, Carmen? None so far. Okay, great. And there's our beautiful Odyssey. So there's three real different types of vaccines that are used in veterinary medicine. Um, we'll talk about the modified live vaccines, the recombinant vaccine, and then our killed vaccines. So the modified live vaccines are live attenuated vaccines, which means that it's a less virulent version of the disease that will um, contain a living microbe. It's been weakened, so it can't cause disease, um, but it's the closest to a natural infection. So these are really good teachers for the immune system. They elicit a strong cellular response, strong antibody response, and they oftentimes will uh, confer lifelong immunity with only one or two doses. We'll talk about some different types of vaccines that we'll see with that, but interestingly, our distemper and parvo vaccine are usually going to be modified by vaccines. 
So the issue with modified live vaccines is that they must stay refrigerated. They are more easily made for viruses than bacteria. And so that's why our distemper, uh, distemper virus and parvovirus vaccines are made as modified live, but our Lyme, which is a bacterial vaccine is not. Um, you do not wanna use them with a patient with a compromised immune system. They do have the potential to revert to a virulent form. So they have the potential to go back to the disease causing and actually cause disease. We see that most commonly with our Bordetella vaccines. Um, most of our Bordetella vaccines, which is for kennel cough, upper respiratory kennel cough, um, many of those are going to be modified live vaccines and they actually can cause a cough after they get the vaccine. Um, and then, as I said, distemper parvo is usually going to be a modified live. Recombinant vaccines are a type of vaccine where pieces of the disease causing agent will, um, that will cause the greatest immune response are, are identified. And then they use recombinant DNA to grow just that portion of it. It's not a live vaccine. It can never revert to virulent form. It generally causes fewer vaccine reactions because there's fewer components to the vaccine. And many of our Lyme vaccines are recombinant. I think most people uh, are familiar with the Lyme vaccine, but most people don't actually realize how it works, which I think is one of the really cool things about the Lyme vaccine. So I'm gonna talk about it real quick. Um, when the, Lyme, the organism Borrelia that causes Lyme disease is within the tick, it lives in ticks, the tick bites the dog and then transfers the Borrelia to the dog. But while it's in the tick, it expresses an outer surface protein. And the vaccine is actually against those outer surface proteins. And so when the tick bites the dog, they take a blood meal from the dog and they get antibodies to the outer surface proteins. If the tick stays attached long enough, it will then vomit back into the dog. It puts all of the blood that it's, that it's had back into the dog. And that's when the Borrelia and the Anaplasma and the Ehrlichia and the Babesia and the Bartonella and everything else that the tick is carrying, all of the diseases that the, that the tick is carrying will go into the dog at that point. Once the Babesia, the, or I'm sorry, the Bartonella, the, um, the Lyme <laughs> transfers back into the dog, then uh, the Borrelia, thank you. <laughs> um, then it changes its outer surface protein. And so it used to be that we used a vaccine that only had outer surface protein that was expressed in the tick. So we saw very, very few reactions with the Lyme vaccine because of that, because the dog's body never saw that outer surface protein. What we found, however, is that they just weren't getting enough antibodies to um, neutralize all of the Borrelia that was in the tick. And so we've added other outer surface proteins now that are actually in the dog. We have not seen more vaccine reactions, thank heavens, um, but the Lyme vaccines now are even better than they were 10 years ago because of the expanse of outer surface proteins that they cover. I think that's a pretty cool thing. We all have to get excited about something. Um, and then the third type of vaccine are our killed vaccines. And these are gonna be the most stable vaccines. They don't usually have to be refrigerated. Um, they travel well across um, desert countries. The antigen's been deactivated, uh, but, and the killed vaccines don't stimulate as strong of an immune response. So they do require revaccination. And rabies is the most common of those killed vaccines. I honestly did not check to see if influenza is still a killed vaccine or if that is now more of a modified live. I don't know the answer to that. So I was going to, oh goodness. I was gonna take that influenza off, but I can't edit my slide. So ignore that, that doesn't live there. Rabies lives there. So with the vaccine types, the attenuated, as we said, those are gonna be the live viruses that have been modified make it less virulent and they stimulate a greater immune response. And then the non-attenuated are killed viruses with a lesser stimulation of the immune response. So when you talk about strength of a vaccine, researchers will talk about how hot a vaccine is. 
which means how much does it cause the body to react? And so the goal is to manufacture a vaccine that causes the immune system to respond, but doesn't have unintended side effects. So for example, the Lyme vaccine in people, it was made, um, gosh, they were doing that, I would say probably 15, 20 years ago now that the Lyme vaccine in people was available. The problem was that it had to be a very hot vaccine to get any kind of immune response. And so people were having terrible reactions to it, extremely painful at the injection site. And then the antibodies were only lasting for about four weeks. So it wasn't causing, it was, it was a lot of, of negative side effects, but not causing enough of an immune system response. And that was why the, the Lyme vaccine for people was pulled off the market. So adverse events to vaccines, um, the USDA considers any undesirable side effect or unintended effect as an adverse event. Adverse events are not required to be um, reported, but we do recommend reporting them. So anytime that I get an adverse event in my clinic, we'll send a notice to the, we keep a, 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 re, a log of it at the clinic and then we send a notice to the vaccine manufacturer about it. And you can see anything from um, just some general soreness, not feeling well, to um, a couple of my dogs would get lumps wherever I vaccinated them. And then I would eventually remove the lumps and they would say, yep, these are actually vaccine associated lumps and you know, nothing to worry about, but they would show up every place that I vaccinated them. So those are all considered adverse events. Anything that you don't want to happen, and that also includes not responding to the vaccine. So if they actually don't um, build the immune response that you are hoping for, that would be an adverse event as well. Um, as I said, they're not required to be reported, so we don't really know how much it happens. Um, there's general, general not feeling well to hypersensitivity reactions to actual tumors. Some vaccines are more prone to cause certain types of issues. Rabies vaccines are more common to cause the lumps that I just described from a couple of my dogs. Lyme vaccine um, can cause general muscle soreness. Uh, the Bordetella vaccine can cause some coughing. But the more significant adverse event to vaccines are when it causes the immune system to start to kill itself. And so we see that as an immune mediated hemolytic anemia which is uh, basically the immune system attacks all of the red blood cells. And then the immune mediated thrombocytopenia can also show up, which is the immune system attacking all of your platelets. So if that happens, either one of those happen or together they happen as Evans syndrome. And that is a very dangerous, potentially fatal side effect to vaccinations. It's not common, but it does happen. So why vaccinate if we could have these issues, right? I mean, we don't wanna put our dogs at risk. Um, but what we recommend is doing a risk assessment. So you evaluate to see what diseases your dog's gonna be likely exposed to due to your location, your lifestyle, um, and then see what the vaccines are where the benefits will outweigh the risks. And so we hear about herd immunity and they're talking about it more and more now with COVID if, if herd immunity will kick in. And what herd immunity means is that everybody else is vaccinated. And so you're less likely to be exposed to the disease because everybody else has the vaccine, but you don't. The problem is that herd immunity, the concept falls apart when nobody's vaccinated. And that's become more and more of an issue with our kids in schools. Um, that could potentially be a big issue with coronavirus when we have a vaccine, people may expect that herd immunity will kick in for them, but if people aren't getting the vaccine, then it's not gonna help. So I think I skipped a page. No, okay. Um, so there are a couple of different vaccine protocols that I'll mention. Um, the AHA, the American Animal Hospital Association has a vaccine protocol. They actually have a lifestyle-based vaccine calculator um, and you can go to this website and you punch in your dog's age and, and all of this other information and it pulls up what they recommend for vaccines for your dog based on, on, um, on its lifestyle. But it's really broken down into core vaccines and non-core vaccines. 
And the core vaccines are going to be your distemper parvo vaccines. Uh, adenovirus is also um, part of the core vaccines. And you don't hear us talk about adenovirus much because adenovirus is part of the distemper parvo uh, vaccine. But um, distemper and parvo are the two that are mainly focused on with that. Rabies is a core vaccine. And then non-core vaccines are all the rest of them. And that uh, is recommended to be given based on the risk factors. So we'll talk about what those are too in just a second. So the last one that I have here was updated September 5th, 2017. If you go to aha.org's website, you can see if there is something more recent. I have not looked. Um, but the core vaccines, as I said, distemper virus, parvovirus, adenovirus, and rabies. And then the non-core vaccines typically are going to be Bordetella, influenza, Lyme, Lepto, and your rattlesnake vaccine. So you may hear or your vet may tell you that there are other vaccines that are available that are not on this list. The reason they're not on this list is because they have not been shown to have efficacy um, for the general population. So um, examples are corona vaccine, which in dogs, coronavirus shows up generally as a GI issue. Uh, but the corona vaccine is not very useful. It doesn't really prevent them from getting corona. Uh, there is a Giardia vaccine that has not been shown to be useful. And then uh, about 15 years ago, they came out with a dental vaccine, uh, but it has not been uh, shown to be efficacious either. So many people know about Dr. Dodds. She is... Um, a, uh, she's actually a lifetime member of Otterhound Club of America. Um, she did a lot of our original work on Glansman's thrombospinia, the bleeding disorder that Otterhounds have. Uh, but she has some, some protocols for vaccines. And so I know a lot of people want to follow Dr. Dodd's protocol. So I put it on here. Um, I will talk about what she recommends, but um, I will also talk about some other options to Dr. Dodd's protocol as well. So um, her general idea is to try to get the fewest number of vaccines, but still protect, which is always, uh, it's always my goal for my patients as well, but I don't necessarily follow her protocol. Um, and so it's just a matter of professional judgment for what your vet is seeing in your area and what needs to be done. So um, her protocol says that at nine to 10 weeks of age, you give December parvo, modified live vaccine, um, 14 to 15 weeks of age, you repeat that. And then at 18 weeks, parvovirus only. And so some newer research that was three years ago said that the last puppy parvovirus should be at 18 weeks old. We're gonna talk about um, why that is and options to that in just a minute. So then she does a rabies vaccine at 20 weeks. She wants to make sure it's mercury free. Um, she boosters distemper parvo at a year of age. You can booster or titer. We'll talk about titers in just a minute. And then um, you booster the rabies when they're about a year old or a year after they got the first rabies. And then you can perform vaccine antibody titers for distemper and parvo um, every three years or more often. You want to vaccinate for rabies according to the law. Uh, in some circumstances, you can get a waiver from the state veterinarian for your dog to not be vaccinated for rabies, but it's very rare for most state veterinarians to approve those waivers. Your dog has to be in the middle of chemotherapy or other immunosuppressive treatment generally to get a waiver. And most states, Maryland in particular, um, will not approve lifelong um, waivers. They just do a temporary waiver. So talking about options to vaccinations, um, the titer is what I just mentioned. And basically what you're doing with a titer is you're checking the blood antibody levels to see if there's sufficient antibodies so that you don't need to vaccinate. It's primarily done for distemper, adenovirus, and parvovirus. And it can be done for rabies, but despite having adequate antibody levels, there is not a state in the, in the country that accepts uh, rabies titer in place of vaccination. So um, if you're traveling to other places, if you're traveling to Hawaii in particular, you have to have a rabies titer to prove that your dog has been, has enough antibodies and is not going to be taking rabies over there. But um, 
they don't accept titers in place of vaccination. And then um, maternal antibodies are one of the reasons that puppy vaccines and puppy vaccine series get mixed, get mixed up and messed up all the time. So puppies get antibodies from their moms through their placenta, but also through their colostrum, which is the first milk that the mom has once the puppies are born. We used to think that it was a, that antibodies were absorbed for 24 to 36 hours after birth, but now it's believed that it actually happens within four to six hours. And then after that, the gut is not going to be permeable to the really large molecules that are the antibodies. Um, so it's a much shorter time that you want to make sure that all of the puppies get to be nursing so that um, they can get lots of antibodies from their mom. They stay active for a period of time. It depends on how many antibodies they get. And then they call the window of susceptibility the time between when the maternal antibodies are waning and the time that the puppy's immune system starts to respond to the vaccine. So you want to boost your puppy shot so that a vaccine is given after the maternal antibodies have started to wane. If you vaccinate while the puppy still has maternal antibodies, it actually doesn't do anything in the puppy. Um, the maternal antibodies will go and take care of that vaccine. They'll, they'll go kill the vaccine. And so the puppy's immune system never kicks in. It never activates the, the T cells or the B cells. And so um, there's really no use to giving that. So this is the point. Okay, so um, I'm going to go back to here and I'm going to talk about a newer option that we have. Um, sorry that it can't be typed out, but we'll just chat about it. It's called a nomograph and it is done at the University of Wisconsin if anybody wants to do it. And basically what a nomograph does is it gives you a, qu a quantitative amount of vaccines that the mom is carrying, of antibodies that the mom is carrying. And then they tell you based on a calculation how long it's gonna take for the maternal antibodies to wear off. So then you know at what ages you have to vaccinate the puppies so that you're getting the puppies vaccinated after the mom's antibodies have worn off. So the problem with the nomograph is that every puppy is going to ingest a different amount of colostrum and not everybody's the same in the litter, but it really works better if you just assume everybody's the same and we cover them as much as we can. And so most of the nomographs that I have seen will tell you to start vaccinating around eight weeks of age um, to cover those puppies that didn't get as much colostrum and to continue up to or after 16 weeks of age, um, usually every four weeks, um, so that you're covering all of the puppies that, that had the most colostrum as well. You're getting them after their mother's antibodies are down. Um, so when in a study that they did, I thought it was interesting, they, the transfer of maternal antibodies ranged from um, not having any at the day of birth to having antibodies last for 22 weeks. So that would mean that if a puppy we vaccinated at 16 weeks still was in that 22 week group, that those vaccines that we gave the puppy at 22 weeks would make no difference at all. So um, it's a good reason to do the nomograph. And if you want to do that with your girls, you collect serum uh, two weeks before they whelp or two weeks after. You don't want to do it during that uh, that month that they, you know, within that month of, of the whelping time frame, because a majority of their antibodies are going into their mammary glands. So you're not going to get a good value of actually what they're carrying and what they're transferring. Um, you do want to recheck it for each litter. They say to check it within a year, but the closer you can get it to that two weeks before they're whelping, the more um, correct your answers will be. And then they recommend titering your puppies. So checking their, their bloods to see how much um, antibodies they have come up with on their own two weeks after your final dose based on the, the uh, nomograph. And typically that's gonna be either around 24 weeks of age or at six months of age. Most of us vets at this point in our in, in life will, um, 
give our last distemper parvo vaccine at 16 weeks of age. And then the vaccine manufacturers tell you to boost it at a year. And so in my clinic, we will give the last vaccine at 16 weeks. And then I boost them. Um, instead of boosting them at a year, I titer them at a year. But bless you. But that means that for the puppies that did not respond or the puppies that um, still had maternal antibodies in place, they have not been protected from that 16 week shot up until the year when we check them and find out that they're not, uh, that they're not protected. So I think that uh, having a titer done at 24 or weeks or six months of age is really the best idea because you're gonna really cut back on the number of times that you're having puppies out there that aren't being protected. Um, so this is about titers. Um, you use that to, to, to determine the response. Um, everything I just said there. Okay, and so that's everything that I had about vaccines and titers and antibodies and nomographs. Do we have questions on any of that? Uh, not thus far. Okay, I will throw out there, um, I was kind of hoping she'd be here um, Becky had um, a litter of puppies that did not respond to, uh, I think it was distemper vaccine. It could have been proper vaccine. I don't remember which one it was. Um, and so when she found out that they hadn't responded by titering, she went and they boosted them and they still didn't respond. And they had to go and find another whole different type of vaccine to try to booster them with to see if they would respond to that. And if I remember right, and again, this was three years ago that we talked about it, but if I remember right, I think almost everybody but one responded to that. So um, it is something that I think we do see. Um, I think that it, we see it in otter hounds, but we see it in all breeds where puppies are not responding to the vaccines and we have, we just assume that they do because we gave them. So um, that's just something to keep in mind that titering really is a good opportunity to make sure that, that they responded. And I wonder if there's a genetic component um, on how the immune system works that tells us whether or not there's gonna be an issue. So moving on to the reliability of, of information, I think this is probably uh, even a more critical slide than it was three years ago with everything that's going on in the world. Uh, we are inundated with opinions and we really need to evaluate sources before we decide that we're going to follow anybody's opinion. And so um, when you're deciding if a source is legitimate, you want to look to see who are they quoting? Are they in articles uh, in peer reviewed journals or are they quoting another opinion paper? And so lots of times you can have somebody that writes an opinion paper and then it's referenced in somebody else's opinion paper and it's referenced in somebody else's opinion paper. And you want to pull the, the original papers because oftentimes the conclusions that you're reading the third or fourth time through do not match the original author's opinion. So you can find the papers on PubMed, Google Scholar, um, Carmen can probably get them for you. Uh, I can find papers for you, but it's very important to really look at the source of of what it is that you're learning from and make sure that the information is actually true and good. That's all I got, guys. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, unmute your microphone and uh, ask them verbally instead of using the chat. That just makes it a little bit easier. So um, anybody with questions, go ahead and speak up. How? How come titering is so expensive? I had it done for Gable and I was just blown away by the cost. So it depends a little bit on, on where your vet is having it done. Um, if they're sending the titers out to the lab, it's expensive because that's what the labs charge the veterinarians is, an, is a high amount. Um, what my clinic does is we run all of our titers in house now because we can run them much more affordably in-house. So um, just to, to give an example, not everybody's prices are gonna be different, but my distemper parvo vaccine is $46 and my titer is 67. So it still is a little bit more expensive, but it's not as bad as some of them are. 
you can always ask to have blood pulled and you can submit blood to the University of Wisconsin. Um, you can submit, Jean Dodds will run titers as well. I don't know what she charges, um, but you can take care of sending blood yourself if you can't afford or don't, you know, can't afford the price that the vet's charging to go to their lab. Um, because I had it done, I think it was two years ago. Um, and I don't know whether she has updated her equipment to put it in to her own clinic. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other part of it is it's an unknown. It seemed to be an unknown whether or not the titers would be effective for two years, three years or forever. Yeah. So what we recommend and what's recommended generally um, through AHA and, and Gene Dodds is that if you titer and they're protective, then you titer every three years, which is the time period that you every three years. So uh, which is the time period that you would be vaccinating if you were vaccinating. So the vaccine is uh, due every three years. And so instead of vaccinating, we would titer. Um, I can tell you with my own dogs, um, they get their last puppy vaccine at 16 weeks. I have not run a nomograph on any of mine yet, so I don't know what it would turn out to look like there, but I have not yet ever had to boost a distemper parva vaccine and Odyssey lived to be almost 14. So, um, you know, my 11 year old, my nine year old, none of them have needed to have distemper parva vaccines boosted yet. Oh, thanks. Yeah. We had a nomograph done on uh, our girl that had puppies um, three months ago, and it, that was the first time we'd ever done it. And it was, yeah. it was very cool. And it was through the University of Wisconsin. Um, I, and it was pretty reasonable price too, is I think it was 104 or 140, I don't remember which, including the uh, shipping and everything. So I, compared to what I had been charged for titers by a different vet in the past, I thought that was pretty reasonable. Yeah. Um, and University of Wisconsin is the only place that you can have the nomograph done. Nobody yeah. else does it. So yeah. you have to send to University of Wisconsin. Dr. Schultz's lab. Yep. But I can, if anybody wants, I can get you the info. Or Robin can. She's been, yeah. she's done. And they have a website that you can yeah. uh, um, get all the information to either do it yourself. They have a little like five page protocol where you can either uh, fill out the application to do it yourself. They tell you exactly how to send it how much plasma they need or serum, whatever. And uh, otherwise your vet will know how to do it typically. They, uh, tell me Robin, did they tell you to vaccinate at eight, 12 and 16 weeks? They told me to vaccinate at uh, eight. So eight and 12 and then 15 weeks and then tighter at 17 weeks. Yeah, they like to tighter two weeks after the last vaccine. Um, if you are not, vaccinating with a nomograph, I would wait until six months of age because um, as I said in their studies, some of the maternal antibodies went out to 22 weeks. So if you titered at 20 weeks or 17 weeks in Robin's case, then you could still be reading maternal antibodies and not actually puppy antibodies. Good point. Anybody have anything else? You answered all the questions that I had. So you covered everything yeah, really well for the questions that I came in with. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Speak up. I don't see any coming over. Ah, there's my Lola. She's trying to bite Robin. Flappy <laughs> uh, ears. She's going for the cords like her brother. She is. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay well thank you everybody for for coming and i appreciate your attention if there are any questions at all feel free to contact me at any point in time and thank you so much joey for providing us this presentation it was very interesting and i will be putting it on youtube um shortly and uh, so it'll be available to refer back to. And I'll also put the links that were on your um, PowerPoint on the description in the YouTube video. So if you just okay, want to go to links, um, it's easy to get to without going through to the uh, exact point in the presentation. Um, and then, uh, so I think there was like three of them, the lifestyle and then the uh, AHA uh, yeah. two of those. So I'll put those in there and uh, 
or maybe we can add a link to um to university of wisconsin's website that would be great i'll do that yeah, also and uh the uh, next Otter Talk, I'll give an or Otter Talk. I'll give an ad for the next Otter Talk. I'm going to be on vacation for um, a good bit of November. Um, we have vacation that we either need to use or lose, so we are going to go home for a long time. And our next Otter Talk is going to be on December 4th, and that will be the Colorado State University CBD study. They're going to share their uh, information with us um, on December 4th. The time has not yet be de um, been determined, but as soon as it is, um, I will put it on groups IO and then I'll send out um, invitations just like normal um, as it gets closer. Um, but, and you can always, if you wanna sign up right away when you see it hit, hit groups IO, you're always welcome to do that as well. And then um, we don't have dates for a few that we will have. Um, we'll have one on uh, um, grooming and maintenance, and we're going to have one on um, form and function coming up as well. We were waiting for that Colorado State University one to be scheduled before we scheduled those around it. So there might even be um, one before the Colorado State University one if we can get it in there. It's hard with Thanksgiving and everything and everybody being busy, but those are upcoming. And if you ever have anything that you want to share your knowledge about uh, or have a topic you want to hear about, just reach out to us and let us know. We'd be happy to have you as a panelist and we'd be happy to cover uh, topics that anybody is interested in if we have people that are wanting to have additional knowledge. So just let us know, that's what we're here for. And I wanna thank everybody for coming. Carmen, thanks for being there. My little buddy, Joey, thank you. Appreciate yes, it. Thanks, yeah. Joel. Oh, absolutely. And you all have a good night. Yeah, have a good night. Okay, good night. Bye, bye, everyone. Good night. Night. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Joey. You're welcome.